Hey, what's going on, family, friends, and loved ones, saints and sinners? <laughs> this is Christian Smith. See, I got some sweat here. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. Uh, I'm excited, y'all, because my mom is with me today. My mom is with me. So this is the first time we've done anything like this. I'm Christian Smith. I'm the pastor of the faith community. Um, we're here talking about 70 years of marching, the, the movement for justice and civil rights then and now. I want to let my mom introduce herself uh, before we get into this real talk session and to just let her tell you a little bit about herself. Go ahead, Ma. Hello. Um, again, I am Tony Smith. I am Christian's mom. Um, I am a 64-year-old uh, mother and grandmother of mother of three and grandmother of five. Um, I am a graduate of Bishop College, Dallas, Texas in 1978. And today I'm just a really proud member of the faith community. Well, don't forget about the greats. The who? You, you're great grandma now, oh, ain't you? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Right. I just, I got a one-year-old great-granddaughter. Oh, my God. I yeah. Still, I'm still not used to that. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, I'm going, I'm going, <laughs> like, ride that out, because I'm a great <laughs> uncle at, at 36. So, you know, I'm <laughs> feeling good and old. Good and old. Hey, Mama Randall. Hey, uh, hey, Queet. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, Queet of Russ is my big sister, like, Queen of Russ is thicker than blood when it comes yes, to me. Yes, she um, is. When you, when you get my new book, Breaking All the Rules, you'll see a, a segment in there about uh, Queen and I uh, back in the day when I was a kid. So uh, always, always love to see my big sister, Queen. We got Grayson in here representing TFC. We got Ariana. Ariana. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, do me a favor, everybody who's watching, if you would um, share this stream, let somebody know. I think this is a very unique uh, discussion that we're having, kind of bridging the generational gap. And you get to see, um, you know, where I come from. If you've ever wondered, like, you know, <laughs> what's the basis for me being who I am? You're looking at her right now. <laughs> Uh, so whatever you don't like about me, you need to talk to her about it. <laughs> I had help, you know. <laughs> this is true. This is true. But I didn't want to throw dad under the bus because he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that comment, yes, Quita is the ranch dressing girl. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you're one, so so that's that's Grayson representing the faith community right now. So Grayson actually helped to not helped. Grayson edited my book. If anybody's an author, you're looking for a premier editor, you need to contact Grayson Hester. So he's read the whole manuscript. He edited it, and uh, there's a there's a piece in there about me and Quita and ranch dressing. Uh, so absolutely. Um, thank you, Ariana. For rushing to join us. That makes me feel good. Good to see you. <laughs> well, thank you, Eve. I appreciate it. Hey, Eve. It's good. It's good to see my family. So let's let's get into it. Um, we are in the midst of one of the biggest racial revolutions we've seen since the civil rights movement. Um, it's definitely bigger than anything I've seen in my lifetime. Yeah. I was born in 84. And, you know, when I was born, it just race wasn't at the forefront. I, I greatly appreciate my parents for helping me to understand my history. Uh, but when I was coming up and learning about my history, I was learning about it as my history more so than my present. So I didn't fully make the connection between what my ancestors went through and what I'm experiencing now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, 
I'll, I'll never forget being a kid and mom, of course, you're going to remember this watching the uh, keep your eyes on the prize series. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I knew about my history, but because we were kind of in this period of um, contentment or complacency, I don't know what you want to call it. I didn't really make that connection to the here and now, but now we're in this position where there's a huge connection that is evident in our faces uh, between our history and what our ancestors experienced and what we experience now. Mm -hmm. And today we just want to talk a little bit about that connection and what it's like for you having been there, you know, during the first civil rights movement, you were a kid, but you were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then now being one of our elders and experiencing from this from this position. <laughs> yeah. Listen, if people are going to call me old, mom, like, I'm sorry. When I when I got when I got 20 year olds who think I'm old, I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> again, um, if you're watching this, please hit the share button. Help us spread this message. Help us spread this word. Support what the faith community is doing. Hit the share button. So, Mom, I want to ask you uh, real quick. Um, how do you experience this racial movement mm -hmm. differently than the racial movement of your childhood? <clears throat> One of the things that, um, as I was thinking about this, is uh, looking at my childhood and I realized that I grew up in a bubble actually. Um, I'm a daughter of, a, of an, an army soldier. Uh, so I'm an army brat and I grew up, I was born in Fort Hood. I lived in Temple, Texas where I lived in the house that my grandfather built. Um, I, went, I lived in an all black community I went to an all black school. I went to uh, the all black grocery stores in our community and I grew up around my cousins and my aunties. And then um, I spent time in Germany and the military housing and the military is, is different. It's, uh, we didn't experience, I didn't experience the kind of racial tensions you experienced that, that my, my parents were experiencing. Uh, so there were, uh, all the kids were together, white, black, all ethnic groups were together in school. Um, and so there was no difference. If you didn't like somebody, it wasn't because they were black or white. There were other reasons, <laughs> but that wasn't a factor. And um, it wasn't until, it, it wasn't until I came back from the States in 68, came back from Germany in 1968, uh, that I actually began to, to see racism. I, at that point, I hadn't, I hadn't experienced it before that, at that, before that point. But I began to see it in, as I moved to Killeen, Texas, uh, and experienced this strange phenomena. And it, for me, it was strange <laughs> because the white people that I experienced in Germany, not the ones I was encountering in Killeen, and, um, um, but it was also during a, a reconstruction period of, uh, cause, uh, cause in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, you had uh, a, a great influx of new uh, black politicians, uh, uh, black businesses were growing. So it was, it was, it was, a, it was a lot of, of growth and experience. Um, but the difference, I think, right now, the difference then and now are white people. Our message has not changed. We've been saying the same thing decade after decade after decade about police brutality, about inequality, about poor health care. We've been saying the same thing all these years. And when we were saying it when I was a kid, white people were saying, well, I don't see it. I mean, that isn't our experience well, with the police. So what are you guys doing that's causing that? Because we're not experiencing that. And 
thank God, but we did have some, we did have some white allies, you know, at that time. Today, it, it is really phenomenal to see that white people now have said, oh, now I see what you're talking about. And so our uh, uh, cohort of, of uh, supporters and those who are helping us to, the, uh, to tell the story are now not just black people. There are white people who are telling this story. And uh, again, that is, that is phenomenal, phenomenal to me right now. You, you brought up such a great point. And honestly, when you said it, my mind went in a totally different direction. What? And I have to share share why. But 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 before I do that, I want to first of all acknowledge Quita said you're not old. <laughs> Queen, I didn't say she was old. I called her our elder. Thank I didn't you, say Queen she was old. Boy, I didn't call you old though. Wait a minute now. <laughs> Queen, come on now. <laughs> yeah, and and of course, you know, we got Grayson on here calling me an old man uh and antoine we miss you too brother it's it's, it's uh you remember antoine right mama from uh from mercer he, yes he's called yes, a small yes, group too. yes so antoine yes. was a part of the faith community yes. before we were the faith community when he was a student at mercer university he would come to our small group that met in uh our apartment uh, so we love you man definitely love you um so when you said the difference today is white people, you were talking about white people being better allies yeah. in, in this particular movement. Yeah. And I totally agree. Like I, I didn't live in your, in, you know, the, the seventies and the sixties and the seventies. Um, mm -hmm. and I wasn't aware in the eighties. So I don't have a recollection of what allyship looked like then, right. but it is such a blessing to see white people, going to the streets oh my and gosh. doing the work that yes. they're doing yes. and advocating um yeah i'm i'm incredibly grateful i have i have you know so many white people in my network who are really serious about this mm -hmm. uh, but because i believe that um if white people don't get upset nothing's going to change that's right if that's white right. people don't get frustrated nothing's going to change because mm -hmm. we live in a white supremacist nation where it requires people who benefit from that system to push back against it right. because they hold the power. But when but, you said white people have changed, you know, I went in a totally different direction because I have this, this stance that uh, how white supremacy functions has shifted drastically just based on my understanding of history because, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it feels to me like, uh, you know, pre-civil rights movement when being racist was acceptable like mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. people defended racism as the way things should be done so white supremacy at one point defended itself and now we live in a time in this racial movement where white supremacy is denying its own existence <laughs> So I feel like when you were coming up, people were saying, you know, what well, is how it's supposed to be. Whites and blacks are not supposed to be in the same place. We need to be segregated. White people should have more opportunity because blacks are not worthy of it. Now we're in a space where they can't really say that uh, on a grand scale. Mm -hmm. So they're saying, there's no racism. What are you talking <laughs> about? Why didn't he just yeah. comply? And then we see this situation uh, with Jacob Blake in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where yeah. he shot in the back seven times. Yeah. And and white supremacists. And when I I want to make sure I'm clear when I say white supremacists, I'm not just talking about white people. Because sometimes when you say white supremacists, people think you're only talking about white people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. White people created white supremacy, but everybody sustains it. Mm -hmm. So you have you have black, all black people. white supremacists, right? You have Asian white supremacists, you have Latinx white supremacists, mm -hmm. and and what I believe is is happening. 
the right. Poor. White is right. Mm -hmm. Right. So you mm -hmm. have white supremacists now who are arguing that racism doesn't exist. And it's mm -hmm. just it's made up. It's a thing of the past, which is mind boggling to me. So when you say white people are different, I was thinking, <laughs> you right, mama, because they deny <laughs> racism now. But you you show another beautiful side of it. Thank you for, for <laughs> have, bringing the optimism to real talk tonight, uh, because we need that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, you know, what? Uh, um, uh, during during that seventies and eighties, uh, white people were trying to, um, at least in my community, were trying to relate, okay, and tr and some were trying to understand, but but they still couldn't quite grasp the the, the whole idea. So uh, a lot of the tendency still kind of kind of, kind of uh, the idea of separation um, still kind of played in their minds, and every now and then it would come out. I, I hear it in teachers well. Well, y'all start fighting and you go where you belong and you go where you belong. So where do we belong? We all on this campus together. <laughs> yeah. So it's those kind of things that would that would come out as we were growing up. And so, you know, it, it, it was kind of like it was trying to go, I guess, undercover, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, um, instead of being just so blatant. But um, what I'm seeing now is is. It, it, it looks like it feels like real change in the hearts and minds of some white people. You know, it's funny. I'm sitting there talking to you and it just struck me because you talked about Reconstruction, this period of Jubilee after the end mm -hmm. of the Civil War, where black mm -hmm. people were in politics, were in uh, politics. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a voting base like black mm -hmm. people voted like crazy. Uh, and then there's this uh, withdrawal from the South. Uh, where where the government that had won the Civil War withdrew itself from mm -hmm. the southern states mm -hmm. and then uh, white supremacists took over again. Then you live through a period where there's a civil rights movement and then you experience this right. reconstruction. Okay. Yes. So what I'm noticing, the pattern I'm noticing that I think we need to be aware of mm -hmm. is that while we experience a reconstruction, it feels like white supremacy does a recalibration. Yeah. Where, mm -hmm. OK, that approach has run its course. How are we going to recalibrate to get a tighter hold on our power and our supremacy? Because now, now we're a young country and when you think about the, the, the history yeah. of the world. So I think like we're starting to see patterns in our country. You were about to say something? Yeah. If you look at if you look at uh, the um, KKK um, in, in back in the civil rights days and before, they were hooded. Nowadays, they are wearing suits and wearing robes and they are politicians. Uh, and they give the air of 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 authenticity and and but it's still the same. It's still it's still the heart hasn't changed. Mm. Um, I'm like I said, but but it is changing. It um, and I was thinking with everything that that is going on now we have a chance of actually cracking this nut of this police brutality mm -hmm. um, like never before, because the police were always the untouchables. Mm -hmm. But now everybody's saying, yeah, we have good cops, but we got to address the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And we got, to, we, got to, we got to address it head on. And then we got to be able to free up those good ones to be able to uh, 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 to expose the bad ones and still keep their jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, we're in a we're in a phenomenal period right now. We really are. Before before I move on to the to the next question, Mom, I want to yeah. ask you to just share a little bit about your experience with integration, because that's one of the that's one of the stories you told me that stuck with me. And, and how I process uh, racial movements today. Can you tell us what your experience as a schoolgirl was like with the process of integration? Okay. Um, in I, I had really I, I really had a 
pretty good experience uh, in junior high. It was just th those subtle little things like, um, I was I was always a good student. I, I worked hard at it, but I was a good student. And um, I remember when I had to um, uh, choose, I was in going to the seventh grade, no eighth grade, and I had to choose what math class I needed to take. And I was supposed to take algebra, but my counselor said, you know, uh, you probably shouldn't take algebra. You probably should do related math because you probably won't do well in algebra. And I didn't know any better. And so I said, okay, I'll take related math. And I ended up teaching, helping teach, teach the class because, because it was, I was so beyond that <laughs> uh, in, in the class. And um, so that, that was one experience Another experience was was in high school when I was getting ready to graduate high school was looking at colleges. Um, and in high school, I was on the, I was a National Honor Society student. And um, my counselor, I can remember his name. I can see his face to this day. <laughs> and um, he asked me what schools I was looking at. And I said, what I'm looking at, you know, East Texas State College, I'm looking at Bishop Cobb, I'm looking at this. And he says, well, um, you probably shouldn't do uh, East Texas State because that's, that's a pretty difficult school and you, you probably wouldn't do well in East Texas. At that point, at, at that point, I, I knew better at that point and knew what he was doing. Uh, but I had already made my mind to go to Bishop College. But I had said, <laughs> I had said, if, if I had not already made my decision, I would go to East Texas just because he said I wouldn't I wouldn't do well there. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. And you you um in addition to that stuff that you just shared, you also told me about how, you know, when you were going through integration, the way white supremacy carried out integration was they took the best teachers from the black schools yeah and sent them to the white schools yeah they took the worst teachers yeah. from the white schools and sent them to the black schools yeah so you still have predominantly black schools and predominantly white schools mm -hmm. that were just like you know subtly integrated yeah but the predominantly white school had the best teachers mm -hmm. black and white mm -hmm. The predominantly black schools had the worst teachers, black and white. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. the insidious nature of white supremacy is is uncanny. Systemic. Yes. Mm -hmm. So tell me this, mom. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think our generation is doing well as it pertains to this movement, and then? What can we do better? What can we learn from our elders and our ancestors that we might be missing right now? Okay. Um, I think what y'all are doing, what this generation is doing well is utilizing the resources that you have effectively. So um, um, the the social media, the, 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 the outlets, everybody's using their, their own platform to get that word out. So it is that we're not just depending upon the media and you know, the media picks and chooses what they're going to share. So they, um, they, they will, they will share the salacious stuff and the, the protesters who are rioting, but they'll, but they'll, but they'll never, but they won't focus on the ones who are protesting quietly, uh, uh, peacefully. Uh, okay. And, but to see, this generation use um, all of their resources to help get the word out. So you all have done a phenomenal job in, in keeping the focus on Breonna Taylor, hashtag Breonna, say her name, uh, doing a phenomenal job on, 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 on Jacob. Uh, uh, Blake. Blake, thank you. <laughs> um, and and then you're also doing a good job with you're also doing a good job using your your podcasts and your your platforms to build up uh, uh, and encourage um, the cultural um, strength mm -hmm. and um, 
just doing a really, really good job making people feel good about themselves and where they are. So yeah, you are a beautiful black woman. You are a beautiful black man. Embrace it. Mm -hmm. And you are worthy of, of love. You are worthy of, 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 of good things. You're worthy of it. And so that kind of stuff, that kind of message just kind of keeps coming out, keeps coming out. It, it has its impact because we, we have heard so much negative about ourselves mm -hmm. that we are hungry for these positive reinforcements. And um, you guys doing a pretty good job at that. Well, we appreciate that. We're going to keep trying. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're going to keep trying. I, I think it, the beauty of social media kind of helps us to reinforce yeah. those messages yeah. over and over again. And yeah. um, I, I heard this a while ago and uh, I quote it all the time. I don't know who originated this statement, uh, but I say it all the time. The only thing wrong with black people is that we think something is wrong with black people. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's, a, that's the only thing wrong with black people. We just think something is wrong with us because we're black. And if and then we and, behave that way, then we behave it. We, 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 we put that into action then. Mm -hmm. it, I remember when teaching, teaching little, you know, uh, teaching little kids and the, little, and the little boys who are always told they were bad. You're bad. You're bad. You're a bad little boy. You're a bad little boy. And and then you ask them, so why you do that? And they say, well, I'm supposed to. I'm bad. Because they've been told that over and over again. Yeah. And so words the, matter. Words do matter. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So so help us because, you know, we got some young people here. Uh, Grayson is, you know, one of our freedom fighters here. We got Ariana. Uh, Janica mm -hmm. just jumped in. Hey, Janica, she's been doing a lot of work uh, with social justice. Um, and then whoever else may watch this later. Um, from your perspective, and of course, you don't speak for your entire generation, right. but just from your perspective of what you see, what can we learn uh, from our elders and our ancestors and how we can do this better? You know, I think um, one of the, the number one thing that that, uh, that, that I focus on with uh, our ancestor is their persistence. They did not give up. Um, well, we live in a microwave society. We want everything instantly. I want to be. I want it now. I want justice now. I want to. I want the top job now. I want it now. Um, this is hard work. Uh, 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 trying to get justice and trying to be treated fairly. It, this is hard work, and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and so you have to be persistent and consistent with um, with your movement. Um, when we don't when we don't keep at it, it becomes like a flash in the pan, you know, everybody's all excited. No, oh, we're going to protest. We're going to protest. And then after and, and the media knows it, they, they know. And even the leaders who are the leaders also know it. And politicians know it. Uh, just give them a little give them, give them a week or so. Then you know, they'll calm down. We back to normal again. This time, this time is different. And, mm -hmm. and we got to be consistent. We got to be persistent. Mm -hmm. with the message. Um, I think um, I think I think we also I would like for for us to have a a better picture of what our end goal is. So we say we want um, to end police brutality. So what does that look like? What do we do? What uh, what are we reaching for? So like when we're looking for the you know for uh, the, the, the right to vote, we had the Voting Rights Act, and we were fighting for the Voting Rights Act. And when we had that sign, then that was that was the the, the the realization of that goal. Now we had to work from them, but that was the seed, that was what, that was what started it. And I think but now we have to also uh, um, define what these goals are, and how do you know when you have achieved it? I totally agree. I, I, I can't think of a 
a better word of advice because we're so early in the game right yeah. now. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, when you think about the Black Lives Matter movement, which is, you know, highly controversial, I don't mm -hmm. really understand why. Well, no, I understand why. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, it's 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 it bothers me that it's so controversial. Like it bothers me that it's controversial for white people because like what part of that bothers you the black the lives or the matter <laughs> yeah like why is a statement of my right to exist an offense to you like so it bothers me that that is an issue and then it bothers me for so many black people because black lives matter is a movement that includes all black people mm -hmm. not just straight black men right. right and the women they allow to come along but stay in the shadows mm -hmm. black lives matter is a movement that incorporates black men black women trans people gay lesbian yeah. if you're black yes. black lives yes. matter includes you in the movement yes and it's controversial in the black community because you have so many people who think that to include these other groups of people is like blasphemy yeah. so it just goes to show that when you do something that's going to affect real change in society mm -hmm. you're going to encounter so many obstacles and not just from those who you know are your enemy from the jump it's the people that you thought would be with you who are trying to demean and degrade the work that you're doing um, it take, takes education you have to keep educating keep keep talking about it keep educating i uh, remember the video you put out about black lives matter and that 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 video that you that's where you talked about what black lives matters means um i had a friend who uh, um had a negative connotation of of black lives matters until she heard you talk about it Mm. And she told me, she said, oh, now I understand. So right. so it is it is really important that we keep keep educating. Right. Keep educating. Keep educating. And we got to talk over a whole lot of loud noises. You got to talk over a whole. But if we keep at it, if we keep at it, uh, um, we will impact the lives of people who will make changes now, but also for our for our my grandkids who are going to grow up and will and we'll get that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the end, Mom. Unless you have something that you want else that you want to share. Uh, you have any final thoughts that you want to share with us? There is there is one thing, there is one thing that I that I, I, I wish um I guess I understood, but I wish would we would change, and that is um what is discouraging is um how we destroy our own property mm. as we are as we are uh, displaying our anger and our rage because it, it never makes sense to me that I am so angry I'm going to burn down my own house and then when I get through I have nowhere to go. I've burned down my grocery stores. I've 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 destroyed the I've destroyed the the um, the businesses who are in my community to serve my community. And I do make the distinction of those who are there to serve and not just to take advantage of. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um and so I I, I wish I, I don't know how I don't know how we can I don't know how to change that. I just know that that takes from our message. Because those detractors, those who don't want to uh, um, hear us and don't want to give us equality, will say, "Uh huh, see, that's the reason why we can't because y'all destroy everything," and and just kind of take away from the whole message. So, I I, I wish that we could, as a part of our message, as a part of our message, teach respect for what. Uh, uh, of what belongs to you. And I think that's one of the things that our ancestors taught us. They respect and they demanded of their children, you respect what you got. <laughs> mm. It's yours, respect it, take care of it, and don't 
look for somebody else to, to take care of it for you. You take care of it. Mm-hmm. And I want us to, I, I would love for us to get to get that message across. Yeah. Yeah. And and I would I would say to that, you know, also uh, understanding what actually belongs to us. Yeah. And, and knowing what we need to take care of and then what's being used to control us. Right. Um, exactly. I've been I've been uh, amused at some of the the looting and riots that have taken place in upscale, predominantly white neighborhoods. And I've been thinking, oh, they wised up a little bit <laughs> like they left the hood. They, they yeah. left Bankhead and went to Buckhead and did some looting. That's going to get somebody's attention. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not I'm not a advocate for rioting or looting. Right. I do understand it. Yeah. And and you don't have to be an advocate of something to understand it. And I always try to put myself in somebody else's position. I have one nephew, Jamal Mertzin. If something ever happened to Jamai at the hands of law enforcement, yeah, you probably gonna have to find another pastor. <laughs> I I I don't know yeah. what I would do in that situation Mm -hmm. so also i'll say this as well you and dad put me in a position that i didn't have to encounter constant police brutality Mm -hmm. constant police Mm -hmm. um interaction because we lived in relatively decent neighborhoods you know the house i was born in it was a good neighborhood now of course right around the corner was a trap house so you didn't want me to go down around the corner I got a whooping one time, y'all, because <laughs> <laughs> I got my butt tore up and I did not understand at the time. My mom used to tell me, don't you go around the corner over there to your friend's house. And I'm like, why not? It's right around the corner. So one day, you know, just being hard headed, I went around the corner and went over to my friend's house where she told me not to go. And mama walked over there. <laughs> I looked out the window and saw her like, oh, I'm in trouble. And now, yeah. And and now that I'm grown, I was like, oh, that was a trap house. She didn't want me over there because they were doing illegal activity and she didn't want me to get caught up. Mm -hmm. So so you kept me in a position where I didn't have to have those interactions with law enforcement. But if I did live in neighborhoods where every day I had to deal with police harassing me because I know black people who have those personal stories, yeah. my response to some of this stuff would be different as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do need to be able to differentiate between yeah. what belongs to us and how to take care of it and the stuff that people are using just to control us and take care of what belongs right. to us. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, well, we're I wanna think. Place. We're in a good place, we're in a good place. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's stressful, but it, it's, it's, it's it's exciting actually to see all that's happening. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love to see it. And it, it has a lot of resistance, but I love to see it. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I just want to encourage everybody who's in the movement, whatever you're doing to support the movement, keep doing it. Yeah. And that doesn't mean everybody has to go out in the streets and protest. There are right. some people who are geared towards that and that is necessary keep mm-hmm. protesting but even if you're not the type of person that does physical protest figure out what you can do to contribute because everybody has to take a part right when we when we talk about the mm-hmm. bus boycott mm-hmm. um everybody wasn't protesting there were some people who just had vehicles and for over a year they were taking people back and mm-hmm. forth to work their contribution to the movement was just as important as the people that did the protest. So figure out how you can contribute, whether it's education, whether it's financial resources, protesting, calling your your um, elected officials, registering people to vote. Let me tell you something. I, I'm, I'm done after this. I'm sorry, but this is this is so near and dear to my heart. If it wasn't important for black people to vote, they wouldn't work so hard to keep us from voting. Ooh. Truly. I'm not saying voting is the end game. I'm not saying that we got to do so much more than vote, but we can't completely overlook voting as if it's pointless, because if it was pointless, they wouldn't work so hard to keep us from doing it. They work an overtime. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. 
anything mm-hmm. they can do to keep us from the polls. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that's it. Listen, um, if, yeah. if the faith community is a blessing to you, um, please be a blessing to us. We have a lot of things that we're working to do. We're a disruptive ministry. Uh, so we don't have the, the huge networks like uh, some churches who, you know, have a lot more support. We're kind of out here on the island sometimes. Uh, so I appreciate my members who decide to, you know, get out here on this island with me and, and disrupt some stuff from this position, especially my mom. You should get breaking all the rules because I tell mom's story in the book and her uh, journey through this process of being a part of the faith community and this concept of greatest commandment theology. So please uh, be a blessing to us. There are some ways you can give down there at the bottom. Uh, you can do it on Givelify, search the faith community. You can go to our website, which is the faith org backslash give. And you can do it on cash app is cash tag TFCATL. We greatly appreciate your support. We're working right now to actually upgrade some of our technology so we can bring a better presentation to you. Uh, So please do support that work and keep doing the work of justice. Uh, We've been marching over 70 years and we got probably got just as many more to come. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So let's keep at it um let me see who we got here uh some people have been commenting Corey earlier said he was young i'm with you Corey. (laughs) and uh yeah mom let me see lisa thank you for watching lisa i'm going to respond to your message i saw today it's been a busy day yeah, Eve said, thank you for saying our generation is doing something right. I think many of us struggle with knowing what to do and if our little acts are helping to make a movement. So many times the younger generation are told they're not doing right. Yep. Yeah. You're encouraging. You're encouraging. Right. And uh, shout out to Ariana for dropping the website. I love my church. <laughs> they just support me so much. Um <laughs> yeah so so let's keep it going and of course right before that the lady that does not like to be called first she dropped her comment pamela we still if you didn't watch uh holy smokes um holy smokes uh season two episode one will drop oh, on on monday it's it's phenomenal oh, oh my god man. i took notes <laughs> <laughs> very cool so we we poked some fun at Pamela last night talking about we got to get her baptized. Uh, so make sure make sure you go check out uh, Holy Smokes season two episode one drops on Monday on your favorite podcast platforms. And if you want to watch the visual podcast, go over to Patreon.com backslash TFCATL and join us there to watch the visual podcast. And you can be a part of the live recordings. So what Mom is talking about that was so good. Um, everybody doesn't have access to that because you got to be a patron on Patreon. So feel free to join us there. That's it. This is TFC Presents Real Talk. Join us on Saturday. Uh, this is Therapy and Theology Month at TFC. So we're talking about that intersection of how our theology ties in with our emotions. Uh, so you don't want to miss it. Uh, this week, the topic is the entanglement. The entanglement. So join us Saturday at four. There's an event on the faith community page. And through that event, you can get the link to join us on Zoom. Mom, thank you so much. Um, You're such you're such a blessing to me personally. You're such a blessing to the faith community. The faith community would not be what it is without you. I guarantee you that uh, because we need wisdom like yours to help guide us. And I know we We push back against each other a lot, but um, it is such a great benefit. And I would not want to do this ministry without you. Uh, So thank you for the wisdom that you share with us tonight. And um, we're going to see you all next time right here. Join us and uh, y'all have a great evening. Have a good evening.